welcome everyone. Um, I'm sure we'll have some people kind of joining us as we go forward. My name is Susan Schoenberger. I am the Director of Communications at Hartford Seminary. Um, I want to welcome you to, to this special event tonight. Um, this is unusual for us in doing something that's kind of two parts where we asked people to watch the documentary first and then join us for the discussion. Um, so I hope those of you joining us had a chance to watch the documentary. And if not, you can obviously watch it, watch it a little bit later with the information that you gained from tonight. Um, I think probably most of you know about Hartford Seminary, but I'll just give you a little tiny lesson about our history. We're, um, we're a fairly unusual seminary in that we started in a fairly traditional way back in the 1800s, 1834. Um, we have Congregationalist roots, but over many years and um, in the last, I don't know, 50 or so years, we really have become known for Christian Muslim relations and interfaith dialogue, now kind of building in the last few decades more into an Abrahamic approach, so Christian Muslim and Jewish dialogue, and um, we, are, we are pretty unique in, in the US because most seminaries here would tend to have um, a denomination that they're associated with, most are, most are Christian. So um, we're, we're a different sort of place and this is one of those programs that I love doing because it shows that there's interest in all of the things that we do um, and all of the particular faiths that we, that we study. So um, when we kind of launched into our online mode in the spring, um, we decided to do a series of webinars that would kind of keep our community connected and um, educate people and bring lots of new people into our circle. So this is one of those. And I wanna really thank the panelists who are participating because um, they're taking their time and joining us to educate us about this, this really wonderful documentary. Um, so I wanted to give one little plug for the seminary for this coming semester. We um, decided a few weeks ago that we would offer a 50% off COVID relief scholarship to anyone taking a graduate level course. And that includes our auditors. So the rate for normally auditing a course is 575 and this special offer takes it down to 288. So it's a really a great deal and a way to kind of, you know, get a sense of what we do at the seminary. So if you're interested in that, obviously you can just check on our website. Um, and we are gonna be also having more webinars this, this coming semester. So please, you know, join our newsletter if you don't already get it and you'll hear about all the different things that we have going on. Um, I am just going to jump right into introducing our panelists, and then I'll have the panelists begin by talking about themselves a little bit and their involvement in this project, and then um, we can open it up to some questions and discussion. So um, I will just go ahead and introduce the panelists who are here. And I would also suggest that if you don't already have your Zoom on speaker view, that would be a good thing to do right now because that way you'll, you'll have a larger view of the person who's presenting and that might help you a little bit. Um, so Rabbi Kevin Hale, who is with us here today is the scribe you met in the film. And he is joining us from Northampton, Mass. His work includes evaluating and restoring Torah scrolls, scribing other sacred items, and teaching about the scribal traditions of Judaism. We're very proud to say that at Hartford Seminary, Rabbi Hale is a candidate in the Doctor of Ministry program. His proposed doctoral project is called Can the Bones Live? The project studies the different ways that Torahs from the Memorial Scrolls Trust, which you heard about in the documentary, are used and cared for by congregations today while looking ahead 50 or more years to consider how and whether the scrolls should be used in the future. 
We also have with us the director and producer of Commandment 613. That's Miriam Lewin, who is joining us from Brooklyn. And her films include documentaries about teaching the arts, housing discrimination, and the Yale Glee Club, another Connecticut institution. Um, she produces classic, classical music radio programs and manages the world's oldest opera super title business. Maybe somebody will have a question about that. Um, I'll save Randy's introduction if she joins us. But finally, we have Lee Smith, who is joining us from New York City. And he is a music technologist, guitarist, and composer who has written music for several independent video documentaries and performance art films in New York and Australia. So um, I, we'll start with Kevin, who is also going to talk to us a little bit about um, a special time that we're entering as we prepare for Rosh Hashanah. And um, hopefully he will Tell everybody what that's about. All right, Kevin, over to you. So uh, I'll say a little bit um, about my proposed project with the seminary. But um, one of the things that was, that's been wonderful about being involved with Hartford Seminary is uh, the, the coming together of different traditions and learning about each other's. And in particular, Liana and I were in um, project called Building Abrahamic Partnerships. And my favorite part of that was when we, you know, had discussions like, well, that's similar to what my tradition is in my tradition. So I want to share with, with this, we are in this really amazing Jewish moment, and it's, it's tonight. Uh, the month uh, called Elul that, that leads us up to Rosh Hashanah, the day of the new year, but it's also the day of, of, uh, of judgment, begins right now. Um, Actually, we have two days of celebrating the new month, but you know, at sunset, the calendar says it's the first. And the signature custom of this month is to hear the sound of, of the ram's horn, of the shofar, every day. And uh, many interpretations, but one is it's this continual wake-up call, and wake up and wake up and wake up, and then be prepared for judgment, liberation, celebration. So uh, there's three sounds. The tikiya is a steady sound. The uh, trua is a little bit shorter sound. And then there's a rapid sound. And, and then ending in another tikiya, which is a, a drawn out sound. And uh, the mitzvah, the commandment, is, is just to hear the sound. So I, I feel like um, you probably heard a lot about me and what's, what's, what's new in Randy and Lee's film that um, speak for me. Um, and it's really important part of the Kevin, I think we're losing your audio a little bit. OK. How do I do that? What do I do? Um, there's a couple of options. One is, um, uh, oops, uh, um, one, one option is for you to put some headphones on because you might have the echo cancellation occurring. You know, how is it right now? Sounds maybe, good. Maybe the shofar kind of messed things up a bit. <laughs> you so might just need to be a little closer to the, do that. To the microphone. Or, um, yeah. So uh, just, I, my work is very um, solitary and over the course of three years, I think, uh, there were times when, when Miriam and Randy would um, follow me and sometimes follow me very closely. And I am fascinated by, uh, you know, I don't know, countless hours and settings of observing how this was distilled into, um, into what it is. Uh, so I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it, I would say. And, um, the, the subject of the film concerning the Czech Memorial Scrolls that, um, you know, really, I'm sorry, one of my favorite characters is, is Jeffrey Orenstein, who is the chair, well, I guess, yes, he's the chair of the trust, um, speaking about the stories of these amazing 
sacred Torah scrolls that uh, managed to survive. And my work, I would say, um, until the virus has really been focused on uh, examining and restoring these scrolls. Right now is an interesting time because most synagogues are not taking their Torahs out. Um, but maybe it's a perfect time for working on my doctor of ministry project. Um, I would like to say, you know, I encourage you to, to, exempt, to consider this program, but um, a decision was just made to, um, over the next few years, that program is gonna run its course. And uh, I think new doctor of ministry candidates are not applying now. But as you said, Susan, my, my focus is really looking at um, these Torahs and they are being held in different settings, all revered and very differently. And uh, there's sort of, I think, burning questions about um, how long will they be used the way they're used? Is there some point at which even this precious relic uh, will be um, allowed to go the way of all flesh? So as Rabbi Hillel said, all the rest is commentary. All right, well, should we go to Miriam? Um, maybe you can tell us, Miriam, how you got interested in this topic, how you found Kevin, and how the whole documentary kind of came to be. I'd be happy to. Well, the, the, the secret is that I've always, I've never lost Kevin because he is in fact my cousin, which is something that, that I don't always say to people because then they say, oh, everybody, every filmmaker wants to make a film about their family. And um, in fact, I've made many films, uh, but I've always made films for clients with budgets and deadlines. And this is the first time that a film has kind of come and grabbed me and said, make me. And so I started, I think Kevin, Kevin told me in some detail about the work that he does with the scrolls from the Memorial Scrolls Trust. You know, it might have been four years ago today, Kevin, believe it or not, it was August of 2016. And um, I just said, that sounds like a film. And for the first time I jumped and started work on a film by myself. And I was very lucky to have as a partner, Randy Cicchini, who I guess isn't gonna make it here from Amsterdam. She and I had worked on a couple of other projects before. She's a wonderful camera woman and a wonderful editor. Uh, so since I am not a tech person, I'm not a camera person, I am not a, you know, push the buttons editor, I'm a work it out on paper and in my head editor, uh, we made a really good team. And she got along with Kevin really well and he let us just follow him to a number of places and really stay in his hair. Uh, sometimes when I think he, he, he had less hair then. Sometimes when I think he really would have been happy to have us just leave. Um, I'd like to ask a question, and I'm going to put this in uh, gallery view for a minute. I'm wondering how many people actually have had a chance to watch the film, if there's anybody who didn't have a chance. All right, that was really bad question asking. Has every, who, raise your hand, please, if you had a chance to watch. Very good class. Okay. I was just curious because I, I didn't know whether some of this was going over people's heads about the scrolls. I will leave the password accessible for another two days so that if anybody wants to watch again or catch up, they can, okay? Great, um, do, Lee, do you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by what uh, your part was in this and, and how you became involved. Okay, hopefully people can hear me. Um, so thank you everyone for having a chance to speak. Um, I have known actually um, Randy through for quite some years um, through um, mutual, well, through, through a relationship and so forth and um, have worked with her on other film projects in the past, um, you know, small uh, sort of sound projects often in different forms, sometimes music composition, sometimes more um, sound um, design or, or literally editing. Um, 
And so I, I actually didn't know that Randy was working with Miriam on this project. And, um, and she sort of approached me saying, well, you know, we've sort of got a, you know, we, we're, we're, we're sort of, we're thinking about how to address some of the, the, the mood or the style and um, that we had some music already um, but uh, we, we, we think we want to, it, it, can, it can, you know, we want some variation, we want some development of that. And so um, for, uh, so Randy and I first of all chatted and then um, because Miriam and myself are both in New York City. So there was this opportunity for us to get together and I think we sort of initially sort of went, well, okay, you know, how does this work? I've worked on several just low budget films, but um, several films before. So I sort of was used to working with an, a filmmaker, someone coming at it from a visual perspective. The nice thing was, was that Miriam has a lot of experience as a musician herself. So I think there was a, the ability to sort of share some language around what, what we were interested in and, 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 even in that, I think there was still quite a lot of iteration. You know, we tried a few things and had very different, you know, initially wrote some music, which was, um, say, a more traditional string quartet, for example. And, and you know, and uh, the nice thing about working, doing music with film is um, you're working with somebody who is taking the creative lead. So in this case, we have a director that's, you know, it's Miriam's project. And so it's great to sort of work with somebody to help them realize their, their creative goal. So, so that, was, that was an interesting task for us, I think, was to sort of hone in on, on what was actually that idea. And I think we both, both of us sort of went through iterations of what we were sort of thinking. And, and, um, and there was also this idea of, of how fixed the film would be before we started to make the music. It's, it's often a little bit of a dance because of course, you know, you're trying to derive a sense of time, a sense of mood, a sense of, of, of pacing. Um, and of course you get that with the way the visuals unfold. And so then you're saying, well, okay, let's make some music to work with those visuals. Well, all films are usually nowadays, particularly with digital films, it's a sort of almost a last minute thing. So, so it's a lot more of a sort of a hedging strategy where you go, okay, I'll write something, um, but it'll probably change. And so, so there was a little bit of that. And, and in the end, I think we sort of ultimately found that the best way was to, to create some, some music that gave, for instance, Randy some more flexibility to sort of incorporate the exactly when the music and the, the imagery will sort of interrelate rather than perhaps me trying to time everything absolutely perfectly. It, it sort of, so it was a very, from my point of view, it was an interesting sort of creative exchange to sort of co collaboratively sort of find what we were looking for there. So I have one more question for, for Kevin, and then I think um, we can open it up to everybody who's here. Um, Kevin, I rewatched the film today uh, just so I could get prepared for tonight. And I, I was fascinated by how you grew up in a somewhat secular family. Um, and in the film, you talk about, you know, deciding to become a rabbi. And, and then you kind of skip to having a teacher who got you into the, the scrolls and the work that you do um, in restoring the Torahs. Um, can you talk about how you made, I mean, it, it seems like a pretty big leap to go from, um, I don't know if you ever did get bar mitzvah, but you, you mentioned that, that you didn't do that in your home synagogue, and then I'm sure you eventually did. Um, but how did you make that leap to the very intense relationship that you have with Judaism today? Oh, boy. I, I am very aware of all the really good stories that I told that could not be in a 23 minute film. And, you know, even though I, I want to say, well, it's, it's in the way this beautiful film is crafted that it's a leap, but it really was a leap. Um, and um, I mean, I, I think I, so since 
my cousin, the producer director has, has revealed that we have something in common. Um, our parents, um, my father and my mother, and also um, all of our parents were refugees from Germany and different relationships to Judaism. But in my family, really, I think what dominated was the tradition of my father, which was, um, it was about as close to um, ethical culture, you know, or, or universalistic as, as you could get. And the, it was, um, I don't know if this made it into the film, but it was pulling on the thread of a sweater and pulling and pulling. And, um, you know, th th it was, there are these amazing moments in life. And I don't know if it was August of 2016 or if it might have even been earlier. Um, I keep on replaying the moment in which I was in the kitchen doing something and talking to my cousin who was, you know, kind of behind me about my work with these scrolls. And, you know, the seed was was planted in her about this could be a film. And so, forgive me, Miriam, but I've imagined that what this film is about is, you know, both me reflecting on what is this Jewish path that we've taken and that that the film is, is looking at that as well. I mean, I am, um, I mean, I, I think, I, I understand that, that uh, my wonderful late aunt Elspeth, her family was more traditionally observant. Didn't really have this in my family, but we all, you know, gave up something coming here and um, it's safe now to reconnect and explore. And I certainly didn't imagine I would be here today, but um, you know, I'm not sure it's qualitatively different than most people's stories when they tell about the, the journey that they've been on. And that's just the start. That's so were good. you ever Bar Mitzvah, Kevin? I actually don't know the answer to that. Well, that that is such a good question. And it, it was it was a Copernican revolution in my life. So what is bar mitzvah? It's a tradition that um, goes back about 500 years, which is kind of long in Jewish tradition, but you know it's only 500 years. Um, and, and in particular in Germany, that there is an age at which um, boys are considered men for, for purposes of, is there a, a minion, is there a quorum? And uh, an age of really the beginning of adulthood. So, a bar mitzvah is really an occasion to acknowledge that. And I, um, I dropped out, as the film says, and the first time that I had that experience you saw in the film of coming up to the Torah and saying these blessings and really taking ownership of the reading of Torah, I was 28 and I realized, oh, I've been a bar mitzvah all this time and this is the first time done something about it. So between 28 and 31, when I started rabbinical school, a lot happened. Um, I, I had a wonderful teacher who inspired me. Uh, his name was Rabbi Louis Reeser, who passed away recently. And um, I walked into his office to say who I was and I wanted to join and I wanted to finally have a bar mitzvah. And we started talking and Within a couple of months, I didn't care about bar mitzvah. I was interested in rabbinical school. I'm, I'm gonna tell, apropos of that, I'm gonna tell another bar mitzvah story. I, I didn't have one, um, but this is actually a bat mitzvah story. When my stepdaughter had her bat mitzvah ceremony, uh, I guess she already was a bat mitzvah, but she had a ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our uh, guests was an hour delayed and that guest was actually my mother so we had to wait and Kevin stepped up to the, um, the the lectern and he opened the Torah and he invited everybody who was there waiting patiently to come up and look at the Torah and many people had never been close to a Torah I don't think I actually had at that point this was before 2016 and I'll never forget the sight of Kevin just quietly 
showing things to people, not in a, a showy way, but just answering their questions and bringing them close to this object that they had seen at a distance their whole lives, adults and children, and, and turning it into, um, in, a, in a way, a, a coming of age for everyone. So I think that's been in my mind, but it's always been in my mind. That's a great story. Um, so I'm going to have everybody go back to the gallery view, if you would like. And um, I would like to just, you know, if you if you go like this and just to let me know that you have a question, I can call on you and we can get the questions out to Lee or Kevin or Miriam. Um, yes. Um, Cool. Lou, yep. is it Lowell? Yes, it's uh, Lowell. Lowell. And, uh, Rabbi Rabbi Hale um, had um, re helped us restore um, one of our Torahs, uh, Memorial, Scrolls Memorial Scrolls Trust Torahs, a few years ago, and and uh, did a beautiful job and uh, really made it special for everybody that that came um, and uh, had a chance to participate um, in, in as part of the um, restoration. Um, I do have a question for you, though, Rabbi Hill. You know, you've you've restored or you've worked on uh, um, many, many uh, Holocaust Torahs. What's probably the most unique thing you've seen on any of those Torahs? You know, all Torahs aren't necessarily all alike. You know, all the words and the letters are, but have you seen anything special or different on any of the Torahs? I know on the, one of the Torahs that we have, you showed me one of the Hebrew letters had some Kabbalistic... Uh, Hmm. Um, symbolism to it so i just wondering if you've seen anything else that's kind of well, interesting as they say what a great question um okay so one of the unusual experiences <laughs> is actually you know i want to just acknowledge ruth and how you you know something ignited in you and you jumped in and became involved in this in this labor of love which is about the, the whole enterprise of, of the um, Memorial Scrolls Trust. So um, I would love you to talk about that. And, and so Lowell, I, 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 I would love to talk about Ruth more actually. Um, it's been really wonderful working with you. Um, you know, what first came to mind was what you just said, which is uh, of the 304,805 letters in the Torah, um, certain letters of the 22 letters in the alphabet uh, take uh, crowns or embellishment. And sometimes this is an opportunity for a scribe to go wild or make a kind of um, lettering commentary. And um, in the Czech Torahs in particular, um, there are embellishments that were, that were mystical Kabbalistic that sometimes even push the, the edge of what we might consider to be a kosher, that is a accepted properly formed letter. So uh, that comes to mind. But I have to say that really, when Lowell we'll reached out to me and um, around looking at this Torah and it took a while and I came to Farmington and we looked at this amazing scroll that I had the, pri sorry, the privilege to restore congregation has a second Torah, and it has to do with, you know, in America, especially a lot of consolidation of churches and synagogues. And this one was in a display case, and had not been looked at in a long time, um, exquisite old. And it, um, we got to a, a place where the mold that was so intense, and it wasn't fresh mold, it was probably ancient mold, that uh, we just decided we actually need to stop and not look at it more. And um, it was rather remarkable to have that, that physical, visceral experience because the, we don't know what happened to these scrolls. They're, you know, very few of them um, have, I think it might be black mold. So we just put it back in its case and we said, you know, one day, it probably should be taken out and we put on what we thought was a strange thing, a mask and clean it. Um, 
but you know, what was the story of that Torah? I would think that when it was put in the display case, it, I'm gonna make a guess that it had not been actually rolled through from say 1940 until it was put on display. So there was a, we are in the pyramid and King Tut is there and it was a remarkable moment. Anybody else have a question? I, I guess I, since I have the mic, I just wanted to make a comment that Lee, when you were speaking, it, it really struck me about the, you know, the, the, the fine detail that went into the music. And I love instruments and music and, but, but I, I'm not conscious of that. And uh, the precision is the word. And, you know, when we talk about religious practice, it, it's easy to, to think about what's universal. You know, there is one God and, and, and yet it's also holy when it's about such precision, you know, a, a tenth of a millimeter makes a big difference in the way a letter looks. And the way that you and Randy were, I don't even have the words for it, you know, doing a level of precision that is comparable to the care and love and precision that goes into writing these letters. So, you know, as you say in Hebrew, kola kavod, you know, it's a great honor, you know, what you've done. Oh, well, thank you. And, and, and I think it was, for me, it was finding that commonality there where, you know, I mean, you know, you're an artist, there's no doubt about it. You're, you're bringing the same sort of sensibility, the same, aesthetic considerations and then obviously all of the the theological considerations the cultural considerations the historical considerations so you're bringing all of these things to bear and it's sort of establishing the same sort of things that you know i think i think that this is a sort of a there's a commonality there in this idea of expression and of course we find that in the idea of the search the quest in 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 theological terms, right? The idea of our quest for our own sense of understanding, a quest for, you know, our understanding of ourselves. And and I'm, I'm sort of, I had an opportunity to read, and this is great that this is an Abrianic, uh, Abrahamic um, uh, uh, seminary because um, reading a book uh, by a Sufi um, a writer, Hazrat Iniyat Khan, who sort of, the, the book's titled The Mysticism of Sound and Music, where he sort of draws the idea of the utterance of the sound, the utterance of breath as the word of God in creation. So that sound and the idea of uttering sound through the voice is an essential component in that creative process. So, so for me, it was a very nice thing and particularly, you know, that, that idea of detail and dedication and, and bringing all of that thinking to what at one level you could think of as a fairly sim simple sort of action of, of marking a, a parchment. Um, so yeah, you know, although in, in the case with Randy and myself, we're thinking in terms of um, milliseconds or, or beats, but it's also that idea, and just to, just to speak technically just for one moment, it's this idea that you just move things just very slightly in time, just forward or backwards, say when a note comes in versus when you see an image and it communicates a, a, a texture. It creates a sort of a sense or a feel or something like that, that sort of goes beyond words. And, you know, I, you, you couldn't actually really truly inquire. It's a sort of a sense of feel and we, you know, and there's always this element. And frankly, often it's a case of playing something, literally physically playing, you know, the keyboard or, or with the, you know, to write things out and you get it. And then if you, if you have to do it again, you're like, I basically have to play this again. I, I can't sit there and just move things around on the screen. I, there's no way I can reproduce what I do. And in the same sense, it's to me anyway, it's that idea of you're executing the, the, the writing of one letter against, you know, with the, with the next. And, and so there's this idea of what you're doing in the moment on that one particular thing, and then how it fits into the bigger picture that, you know, so to me, I think these are these shared conceptions of, of expression and also finding that relationship. 
you know, and, and as I say, I think it, it plays out in different media, but I think the concept's common. Wonderful. I'm, I'm going to go to Annie Smith next. She had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions, but certainly I'll suffice with one. When I watched the film, there was a section, I believe, where it was mentioned where the children were present. And I believe it mentioned that the children, they have an opportunity to write their own Torah if I took it away correctly from the film. So my question would be, what would they write um, in regards to their narrative, so to speak? And then my second question was uh, an excerpt also in the film, I believe Rabbi, when you had restored the particular scroll and then um, you, the, congregants, so to speak, um, were touching each other. And then I believe in the film it mentioned that there's, I'm just paraphrasing, a blank spot where the rabbi, I believe, would then add a question you would like to answer. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last, very last part of, of the last sentence. Oh, I said you can pick and choose which question you'll answer because it was really three and one. <laughs> well, um, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I, I was speaking to children because I think that they're, um, well, let's say this. Um, in, in the Torah, I mean, I think, I think, I think, Miriam, you caught this pretty well. In the, in the Torah are 613 commandments that traditionally, you know, we, we, we try to fulfill in, if we can in our lifetime. And that one of them is to oneself physically, to physically write these words. These 304,805 letters that constitute the five books of Moses in Hebrew, in these traditions, I, I, I don't want to be like copying the guy in the film, but in these traditions that, that go back to time immemorial. So um, what I've noticed is that when I talk about this to adults, there's often an overwhelming feeling of, well, yeah, but you know, come on, you couldn't really do that. We're, we have scribes for that. And when I talk to kids, it's a little bit more of a sense of, oh, right, yeah, we, we could do this. And it's, it's the, one of the amazing things about the Jewish people is we keep on perpetuating this handwritten Torah. So, um, you know, a really successful weekend at a synagogue back when we used to have scholar in residence weekends is when one or two kids come up and say, I really want to learn this, you know, can, can I, and then I'd say, oh, here, here's a quill, here's some ink. Um, and the, there's different kinds of continuity, um, but we have this, this physical continuity in, in the writing. So that was just an exciting moment. And, um, and, and of course the text is fixed. There's a, a really amazing tradition that we, at Sinai, the fixed Torah was given, these 304,805 letters and along with it this oral Torah which continues to unfold and I and I think that 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 speaks to maybe the second part of the question which is everyone you know what Torah are you writing Annie when you write your Torah what is the Torah even though the words and the letters are the same it's this unique um, unfolding of Torah and you know different for everyone in every time and place and uh, I think two questions is um, you know I I pass. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments? Um, yes, Lee? Yeah. Of that idea of interpreting, um, you know, this, this, this text. And to me, it's very similar to the idea of working from a score. 
So in other words, you know, you're bringing an interpretation to it. And so when you, when you speak to a musician who's sort of saying, well, yes, okay, Bach wrote, you know, this score and it, it truly, some of, some of his scores truly are absolutely magical. You know, there's just, I mean, he was a very religious person himself. He, he you know, characterized his process of composition as, as God, you know, sort of expressing you know, God expressing um, uh, that creative process through him, you know, so him being a vessel. And so then when you're performing a piece, there is this interpretive element. And of course, you know, his wonderful examples, Glenn Gould is a perfect example of taking these pieces, which had sort of a, a very canonical sort of accepted form and then sort of bringing a new interpretation to it. So I'm, I'm not necessarily proposing radicalism in, in Torah, but what you're really saying is, is that same sense of finding something new in what seems so predefined or so defined. It's sort of this element of going deeper into what, um, you know, what we first receive. So when you bring a young person's perspective on that, they bring their own new ideas, their fresh ideas, but they, they sort of interpret that within this bigger context. And that's a learning process for themselves, I would imagine. These are some things that just sort of catch my mind. And so perhaps it's a question to you, um, Kevin, to sort of, you know, how you see that interpretive process, and particularly with young people, with people coming to the Torah, um, you know, as a, as a learning process. I feel like I, I want to respond um, obliquely um, because the the um, everyone's experience is different. And uh, okay, so what I'm, I I hopefully that I will have addressed this, but I'm thinking about what was this experience in building Abrahamic partnerships. Um, it, it actually overall in Hartford Seminary, I have been struck by how much we are having common and how radically different we are. And there was a moment in um, building Abrahamic partnerships, basically equal numbers of, of uh, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian participants uh, going through a very intensive week. Um, and uh, there was a day when we, we, we talked about our sacred text. And I, I'm, I, you know, I'm remembering Miriam, in the film, you, you know, you, you have Jeffrey speaking about how the Torah is also, you know, in, in other traditions, and yet we have these really different relationships. So um, in Jewish tradition, what's fixed is the physical text and these letters, and even the vowels is something that's based on tradition. And interpretation, you know, really anyone can jump into this interpretive experience. And what struck me was that the balance is different in Christianity in its forms and the balance is different in Islam in, in its forms. And maybe it's just a matter of, you know, a sound mixing. But, um, you know, I remember when we, when we study each other's texts and like, we Jews were, were being freewheeling in our interpretation of someone else's text. And it was, it was sort of um, striking, you know. Um. Um, I wonder if Liana, who was in that same program with Kevin wants to say anything about her perspective. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, well, I, I, I guess, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to just sh uh, make a short comment because I also have uh, questions for uh, by Kevin. Uh, but I have to say, uh, when we had that, um, some sort of like a scriptural reasonings where, where we, we compare the text, um, I think that the first feeling that I have uh, was a little bit vulnerable because you you you've been so used to with your text and then you have a certain text that sort of um um some of it is probably a little bit contradicting to what you've you've have always appreciate in your tradition 
and then there's some some other texts that sort of challenge your tradition it's 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 very hard to to digest um and especially because you're not an expert um of you know of of, of a holy scripture um i mean uh, i've seen myself as a long life learner uh, of my faith um and I also uh, remember um, that there was moment like people just have to pause. Um, there's so much emotions because I think when we talk about text, it's not just about the reading. Um, I think this this is also something that I appreciate about the document, uh, the documentary, especially when Rabbi Kevin mentioned about the precision. I think it, even the word precision itself, it's may perhaps you know um spiritually it's it's something just beyond explanation when when you immerse in your text um you're you're just someone else who wants to have that better relationship with god and you want to perform your best um and so when when you have this kind of discussion of the the, the different texts and uh um suddenly questions or or, or challenge um a certain understanding that you have for a long time it sort of make you question uh, your path of religiosity. How far have you done really well? But at the same time, you're also questioning whether you've also done enough to understand God's creation towards people of other faith as well. Yeah. So I thought that that's my experience on that. Um, can I have just a quick two question for Rabbi Ab Kevin? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, it's it's been a long time, so it's it's such a it's such a waste if I didn't get to ask <laughs> Rabbi Kevin this time. So yeah. I have two questions uh, based on the documentary. Um, number one is, what do you do um, for a scroll that is totally beyond repair? Um, um, is there any any procedure to retain um, you know the reverence and respect to it? Uh, and secondly is. Um, when I see the video and I see how you wrote, part of me has also felt nervous because I felt precision comes with confidence. How you keep your posture calm and confidence as you write God's words, because I think that's not an easy job. Um, if you're talking about the millennial these days, um, our precision is keyboard. It's really incomparable to like, you know, writing by hand um and and when i see you writing there's no turning back so how do you deal with that yes did, did you say there's no turning turning back i didn't hear the last yes yes right right we we, we can't just move the cursor and, and and delete um you know i i i don't remember if this um <laughs> to use an antique image was this on the cutting room floor or was this in the film of that I, I sometimes will just reflect in groups about the, the this technology that that the technology of picking up making this tool and dipping it in ink and reproducing you know recording this information according to these these rules that are rather strict and then hundreds thousands of years later it can be played back this was a very durable way of recording and playing back information and things keep on changing. You know, it was, it was a challenge when we had to, Ju Judaism, the Jewish people have kept on talking this over, like with this new information, how do we make sense of it and make it relevant today? So the printing press was very challenging. Um, we're in this world where text is not even physical and yet time and time again, deciding, no, we, we continue this physically with our bodies. And, uh, you know, there's a famous um, line of Abraham Joshua Heschel as he was walking with, with, with Dr. King, and he said, you know, marching Selma, and he said, my feet were praying. And there's something about the, the act of carefully, you know, whether you're in the zone or not, you're, you're, you're doing it, is, is a, it, it is a, a sacred act. And I'll leave that <laughs> where it is. Um, the, the first part, I'm sorry, would you remind me of the first? Because I, I, had, I had a thought. If, if there was a scroll beyond repair. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh. and I want to say, Liana, please, you can always text me with another question if it comes up. But <laughs> it's amazing. You know, 
the world is changing and it's bigger and it's smaller and yet uh, we still do this intimate way of recording what happened in this divine encounter at Sinai. Um, there are scrolls that, um, this is such an important question because there are scrolls that practically speaking are beyond repair. Um, you know, in the case of the one um, at, at the, uh, the Wesley community, there was one panel that was technically beyond repair and it was rewritten. But if you have to rewrite, replace, you know, half, for all practical purposes, um, you know, it, it, it is no longer usable, you should replace it. So there is a beautiful and respectful ceremony of burying a Torah and there's a sense in which a Torah, like a person, is, is given that much respect. And, and why this is such an important question is some of these Torahs that were rescued are now 300 years old or older. And it's amazing that they can be repaired and kosher, that is all of those letters are readable. But um, the respect that's given to a scroll that you describe where I mean, there, there's one of the Czech scrolls nearby me in Amherst, Massachusetts, and uh, column after column, the ink is, is gone. And it has great value that it is on display and it's danced with and, and, and it's, it's honored, it's loved the way a person is right up until, you know, even their last breath. And then part of honoring them, if it's a person, is then laying them to rest. So can we and this is really, I'm almost like leaning towards Ruth, who is more intimately involved with the trust itself. You know, can, can you imagine a time at which the trust who owns and cares for the scrolls would say, even though they are precious connection to the Shoah, that as Torah scrolls, they would be given the honor of being buried at some point in the future. Um, but generally speaking, when a scroll is beyond repair, um, it, it, it could be buried or it, it could be just simply kept. Um, I have to say, it, it, normally it's about economics. So we're actually coming to the end of the hour um, very quickly, but I, I wanted to ask Miriam something um, and then maybe we can see if there's maybe one or two more questions. But um, Miriam, how how is this documentary being shown? Is it, is it going out there into the world in different ways? Can you talk a little bit about how, how you do get it out to have people view it? Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that because normally when you finish a film, you, uh, you take it around to film festivals and conventions and classrooms and you have to go there and people have to come there. And in fact, because of the pandemic, uh, in, a, in a very strange and ironic way, getting this film to people who want to see it is easier. I've been doing, Kevin and I have been doing a lot of screenings like this, uh, mostly for congregations that are custodians of one of the scrolls from the Memorial Scrolls Trust. And so it's a congregation gathering the way you are and because they can't gather in person, they come together around something with deep meaning. And we've done some of these on Jewish holidays. We've done some of them just as a study hour. And so it's actually really thrilling to be doing that. One of my goals is uh, to screen this film for communities that are not Jewish. And I'd like to ask all of you for suggestions of communities, either particular ones or types of communities in your world that might be interested and um, you can uh, you can email Susan who will forward that to me since you all have Susan's email address. Uh, there's also a Facebook page for the film Commandment 613 film and you my email address is there you can contact me. Uh, it's info at commandment 613.com and uh, I'm really interested in in getting this film to, to people who might enjoy it and i actually am particularly interested in hearing from you people who people in the room room tonight who are not jewish about your reactions liana i'm assuming you're not jewish and uh, you already shared some of that so i'd be particularly interested in hearing more more of those if we have more time 
Yeah, can I just uh, uh, say something quickly? Yeah. So um, in this room, actually, there's three Singaporeans uh, on top of me. We are all from Singapore. Um, we have Ustaz Khalid uh, is inside here. And also we have uh, Madam Farida. They are all actually a docents from a Harmony Center, which is an, actually an interfaith center in Singapore. So it's, it's a center that helps to um, build bridges between people of different faith. Um, at the same time, um, uh, one of the uh, objectives is to share the misconception on, uh, on Islam. So uh, if, you're, if you're asking me, um, I, I was actually wondering if you have planned to use this video as, as an educational tool for a different platforms. For me, this is a very useful uh, video, especially for, like in Singapore, there's not so much uh, uh, juice. We do have, um, but to have the, uh, to have the opportunity to see someone to explain about the scrolls and the art of doing it, I'm not so sure that's, that something is being done within the synagogue because usually they're, they're more focusing on their prayers um, and the um, welfare of the community itself. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to help create awareness um, for non-Jewish who might not have a lot of opportunity to have a better understanding about um, you know, the, the, the art of a holy scripture um, um, from, from the Jewish community. I was even thinking because like, for example, like in Singapore, we have um, a madrasa. So it's like a private Islamic school. So some of these schools, um, they had, uh, what do you call it? They, they had a session um, on, on comparative religion. So it's basically a subject where on top of learning Islam, the Muslim student, they learn about other faith as well. So this would be a very useful tool to share to the teachers, like, you know, perhaps one of the um, lessons where they just want to share about this video and, and let the students have some thought about it. Because I'm pretty sure 80% um, chances of them having to assess this um, is, not, is not really there. I mean, also, like I said, because uh, Jewish are very small uh, uh, in Singapore and there, there isn't an expert uh, to do this. Yeah. That would be great. something I'd love to explore. Yeah. So we can connect you two. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Um, you know, I know Mike um, earlier before we started the program had mentioned that he has one of the, the Czech scrolls in his congregation in Vermont. And he mentioned that he, he did some internet research and, and came, about, came upon um, Rabbi Hale. Um, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, how many people do this work? I can't imagine that there are very many um, in the US, but tell us a little bit, Mike, about how you came upon Kevin's work. Well, I don't know whether people realize but uh, <clears throat> the gentleman we're talking about uh, is world famous for, for what he does, I, I will say that. Um, the, um, our congregation received about a year and a half ago a scroll from the trust in London. Um, and it was discovered about six months ago that the scroll did have mold in it uh, by great coincidence. Um, in a small town near here in Vermont, Rochester, Vermont, lives one of the world's uh, most uh, respected uh, mold detectives. And uh, he, he flies all over the world uh, looking at ancient documents and library materials and so forth to um, determine uh, whether or not something has mold. He and his staff came to our synagogue and with their machinery, they examined um, the Torah. They determined that it had what they called inactive mold, which uh, means that it's, uh, I guess, not infectious and it can't spread to the other. <clears throat> we have three other Torahs uh, in our synagogue. And um, so we, we, it doesn't, it won't spread to them, uh, but our goal is to see if we can, uh, uh, so what I did being charged with the task is that I uh, 
put out some feelers to the trust in London. I put out some inquiries uh, through our rabbi and through her network. Uh, the name of uh, Rabbi Hale kept coming back. So I, uh, and through London as well. So I uh, contacted the rabbi and as it happens, we're meeting tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Uh, and I, we look forward to that. Let me just say very quickly that we have, as I said, a, a scroll. Uh, and one of the dictates of the person who made the gift possible <clears throat> was that she, um, she's a woman of 96 years old, uh, very involved with uh, Jewish studies and uh, Israel, uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, speaks from a lifetime of history, had the caveat that we not make the scroll kosher. That indeed, that we not do what you see in the document, uh, documentary, uh, to uh, repair the words and so forth. Her feeling was that the scroll should remain as it is, and I'll put a footnote, of course, without the mold, uh, as a testament of what went before and as a reminder that it should never happen again. So uh, that's our mandate. And so we're, as the rabbi and I have discussed by email, we're not looking to restore and make the scroll kosher, but rather to do what we can to make sure that it uh, continues to exist as a living testament of, for all that it stands for. That is wonderful and fascinating. And I'm gonna sit, have the last question for Ruth, who just put her hand up and then- I, I, yeah. I just wanted to offer, um, Mike, I am the Connecticut representative for the Memorial Scrolls Trust. And I'm happy to share my email with you and um, if you have any questions, we have two Torahs, one that our congregation's been using for 40 plus years, that is 260 years old, that Rabbi Hale restored to kosher status, which is how we received it from the trust. Uh, that's a long story. Um, but we also have one that is in a case that cannot be restored that Rabbi Hale talked about. But um, I think I potentially can be a, a resource for you um, in connecting with the trust if you need it. And I'm happy to do that. The other thing that we promised our congregation when we restored our Torah um, or the Torah that's on loan um, from the trust was that we would monitor the humidity and temperature in the ark. Um, and we are doing that. And I know the sensor and I'm happy to share that with you if you need that to be done. That information would be very welcome because we're not, we're not that sophisticated yet. We weren't either. And I went through a lot of uh, researching to find that information. And I'm more than happy to share anything that I have. Right. So, Ruth, maybe you can put your email address in the chat right Happy now. And then, yeah, and then people can can pick that up. Um, thank you so much for offering to do that. And um, what a what a fascinating conversation. And I know our group was relatively small, but we had people really from all over the world. Thank you to all of you joining us from Singapore because um, it must be early in the morning there. I'm. Uh, pretty early in the morning. So uh, it's wonderful that you made the time to, to join us. And um, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, okay. such a, a wonderful way to, I just wanted to brand us. get access to what you all are doing and bring people together around this fascinating topic. Um, I, I just, I'm a huge documentary fan. So Thank you, Miriam, for the work that you do and uh, bringing, you know, these topics that we, we really wouldn't know about otherwise and, and in such a beautifully packaged way. And, and thank you to Lee for your work and thank you to Kevin for being part of Hartford Seminary and um, bringing your special skills and your tradition to all of the people who come to the seminary and participate in what we do. So. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good evening. And yes. May, may, may I do, I mean, just a little shout out because I'm, yeah. I'm so delighted that, that Sheila Pillay has come on. And if, I don't want to embarrass her, but she is the photographer who is producing uh, an exquisite book uh, 
based on going back to the places in Eastern Europe from which the Czech Torahs come, uh, along with, with some narrative. And, um, Fantastic. Well, maybe she can also put her contact information if you, if you would like in the chat, if anybody wants to keep, keep up with that and look for that book. Um, that sounds wonderful. So I'm going to uh, just make sure we get, everybody has the chat information. You're all good. Thank you. All right, thank you thank so you. much for joining. Thank you, Susan, for inviting us. It was yes, really a pleasure. I did want to mention, we have recorded this session, so we will be putting it on uh, our YouTube channel. So I will then send out some information to people. So if they miss this particular hour, they'll still be able to watch the video of the, of the Zoom session. So thank okay. you all so much for coming. Thank you, Susan. This has been a wonderful piece of Torah in, in itself. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.